When people saw my FJ lately, many will ask, what roof rack is that? And I will tell them, I don't have a roof rack. That is a solar panel. You've probably seen solar setups like these, 100 to 200 watts. But I bet you haven't seen something this big mounted on a 4x4. But why? Well, in this video, I will explain the three reasons why I got this specific setup. Along the way, I will also share how I installed it, the real-world performance, and of course, how it held up through off-road use. This setup is definitely not for everyone, but if you are considering vehicle solar of any kind, you'll learn something from this video. Let's get started. The first reason was weight and height. Of course, not relative to a typical solar panel, but to an overland roof rack or rooftop tent. This 400 watt panel by Bujarvi weighs only 37 pounds and measures 1.4 inches thick. A heavily loaded roof is ubiquitous in overlanding, but many overlook the consequences, including myself. For the past seven years, my roof kept getting heavier. About three years ago, I switched to a hard shell rooftop tent with awnings attached, which weighs almost 200 pounds combined. It never felt that bad each time I added a little more weight. But earlier last year, for unrelated reasons, I had to take everything off for the first time. I was shocked to realize how bad my handling had been and how much wind noise those things created. My wife and I do some very long trips, so after I had a taste of how much better my FJ could drive, I decided to leave my roof empty. On the other hand, I had switched to full electric camping with EcoFlow power stations. It is truly game-changing, and it is the direction I will continue. And because of my heavy electric usage, this is where the solar panel comes in. It checks the box for wind noise and handling. So this is actually the best use of my now empty roof. For the stuff that used to live on the roof, I either switched to a portable solution or realized I didn't need them in the first place. To mount the panel on my roof, I kept the rack backbone and two crossbars from my previous setups. I added eight rib nuts all around the aluminum frame and bolted down using T-slot hardware. It's not going anywhere. To route the wires into the cab, I didn't want to drill holes through my roof. So I gutted the factory satellite antenna and routed the wires through that. The antenna seals the roof with a molded rubber gasket and is held down with a nut. So no glue or sealant involved. Very clean and very secure. I really like this panel having an all black design. Along with how low it is mounted, I think it looks pretty slick. No wonder so many people ask me, what roof rack is that? But because this panel spans so wide, I didn't like how the center could trampoline a little. So I added an aluminum extrusion underneath as center support. Now, much better. With the center support in place, if I was really in a pinch, I could carry a waterproof roof bag on top. Nice. You may ask, why not just use two pieces of 200 watt panels or 4x100 watt to reduce the trampoline effect? I did consider that, but the total array size will either be too wide or too long, so I will end up with less total power. This single 400 watt panel has the perfect width and length for a midsize SUV. So this got me the maximum power I could fit on my roof. But is 400 watt really necessary? That sounds like an overkill. Or is it? Now, let's take a look at how much this 400 watt panel actually generates. This is a premium panel with top tier conversion rate, but there are three variables out of my control. The first one is solar angle. I installed this panel in early September, and I live in the Northeast. So from September till now, late January, I never had great solar angle. The best power I witnessed was about 300 watt, which is 75% of the rated power. Honestly, that was pretty good given the non-ideal angle. 
Now, some of you may suggest, why not use a portable panel so that you can angle the panel to face the sun? Yes, that is true, but that doesn't work for me. You see, as a four-wheeler, I want to go places. So 90% of the time when there is daylight, I'm either driving or wheeling. I rarely just chill at the same campsite for days. Therefore, for my use case, a roof-mounted panel is way more practical. The trade-off, of course, is less ideal angle. The second variable is cloud conditions. This one was interesting, so let me show you some real-world examples. Here, we have a dim, rainy day. I got only a little over 50 watts. Of course, I didn't expect much. Here, we have less cloud in the sky, but I still couldn't find where the sun was, and I got 90 watts. In this third example, I could tell where the sun was, but still a lot of clouds. So it wasn't that much brighter than the last one. But to my surprise, I got over 200 watt. Very nice. In the last example, I had true direct sunlight and I got about 250 watts. But as soon as that piece of cloud covered the sun, even though it still looked brighter than the previous examples, the power dropped straight down to 50 watt. So overall, the amount of power wasn't as linear as I intuitively thought. And of course, you could get very different results based on where you are and the time of the year. To get yourself some ballpark idea in reference to me, you can refer to the solar irradiance map. These maps are common reference for residential solar project. But for a vehicle, I face another challenge. My panel moves on the road, and there are a lot more shadows on the road than I realized. Here was a little testing I did. I was driving through Tennessee back in December. With winter solar angle and the cloud condition that day, I got about 170 to 200 watt. Not bad. But after one hour of driving, I only got 120 watt hour of charge. This was because some sections of the highway had a lot of trees. So for that one hour I measured, these trees took out 30 to 40% of energy I could have gotten from the sun. Now, with all three variables at play, the realistic power I got was usually a fraction of the rated power. So if I only had a typical 100 or 200 watt panel, I would get way too little to make any difference at all especially for my heavy electric use. This was why I went as big as 400 watt. It may sound like a lot, but it really isn't. There were days even this giant panel was barely making a dent. Solar is simply inconsistent. Therefore, for vehicle-dependent expeditions, fast alternator charging is always a must. Nevertheless, a solar panel is a nice supplement. If I went hiking for a couple hours, my EcoFlow was still getting charged at the trailhead. When I'm back driving, I can charge even faster than my alternator can support. My FJ charges the EcoFlow at 420 watt, which was a healthy load for my alternator. Yours could be different, but with my solar panel, I usually get near 700 watt combined charging which is top-tier power. Nevertheless, when the sun condition is poor, I can always bet on the constant 420 watt from my car. I made a video on how to get fast car charging for power stations. Check it out in the video description. Now, let's talk about why I chose a rigid panel. Is it durable enough to survive off-road use? This gets interesting, and I want to first share a bit of backstory. When I was looking for a solar panel, luckily as a YouTuber, Bujar V decided to sponsor me one. But this panel was not the one they recommended. Originally, they wanted to send me their new Yuma series flexible panel. Those have six solar cells instead of the traditional monocrystalline. Six is much more durable and can be literally abused. But the issue is, it needs some type of rigid surface to mount to like a rooftop tent, and I just took mine off for my first reason. But even if I custom made a lightweight platform, the flexible panel takes up a bigger footprint per output, so I could only fit about 300 watt on my roof. 
as I explained in reason two, I wanted as much power as possible. So this led me to the single piece rigid panel. It was purely out of mechanical form factor. When I asked Bujar V, can I take this panel off road? This was their response. Quote, even though the rigid panel can be used during off road, its service life will be shortened by strong vibration and falling stones. Unquote. Falling stones? What do they think I do when I sit off road? I have climbed a lot of rocks over the years, but I've never seen one flying over my roof. So I don't really worry about that. But what about vibrations? There are many RVs and vans running large panels like these, but my FJ would definitely see more abuse. So I'm probably in a new territory. As mentioned earlier, I didn't like how this large panel can bounce a little, so I added a center support. This should prevent excessive resonance during off-road. Right now, I have run this panel for 4 months. I traveled about 3,000 miles, including many off-road. And some, I intentionally tried to shake things down. So far, it held up very well and looked just like new. But it's still early to say how long it will last. I will continue to monitor its condition and post updates in the video description. However, if you don't have the same constraints like me and are okay with less power per area, the 6 panel should be a safer bet for off-road. Heck, those could even survive falling stones. Bujar V is kind enough to offer my viewers a 20% discount code for all their solar power. Check it out in the video description. I will post a 1 year update video on my electric setup, so subscribe and stay tuned for that. Thank you for watching, I will see you in the next one.